I invite you to join me in our call to worship. I will read the light print and you can read the dark print and we'll have time in between there'll be a pause so just follow my lead and then we can worship together come and worship be still and aware of God's presence within and around you come and worship be still and aware of God's presence and around you Come and worship, be still and aware of the Spirit's presence within and around you. Be still and know the presence of God, the Creator to whom you come, the Son to whom you become, the Spirit to whom you become. Hear his word, be still and know that I am God. Good morning, everyone. So good to be here with you. And uh, when I, I usually choose music early on in the week, and it was just, it was beautiful weather for me. It was sunny, it was reasonable temperature, and it, it really drew me to the praise songs that we wanted to sing uh, for me this morning, and I hope for you. Of course, later on in the week, we got a good day and a half of smoke, and then we had a few dreary days of rain, but maybe for some of you, the rain was probably the best part of the week, or I know we need it, but I hope that we can all praise God for the beauty of the earth and to thank him for each morning that we have. So let us please rise and sing these two, two hymns for the beauty of the earth and I owe the Lord a morning song. I owe the Lord a morning song.
I want to welcome everyone here. My name is Charlotte Siemens. Whether you are here in person or listening to the recording, may you experience the presence of the triune God. Be still and know. I'm going to ask if we have any guests with us today. I want to introduce a surprise guest who came this morning. I have talked about my friend Rosa Maria, who had a double lung transplant on October 4th of last year. And I know a number of you were praying for her. And this is her first time in church in a group gathering since her operation. She was confined to her home, so when she walked in this morning, I was so thrilled to see her. I also, so welcome Rosa Maria. I also want to welcome... I also want to welcome Ellery and Marlene Peters, who are here from Saskatoon. Kamloops. Kamloops. Oh, they moved to Kamloops. I have not seen them since 1978 when we were all involved in a, a wedding at Camp Squia in the wedding party. So welcome here as well. You want to stand? Welcome, Rosa Maria, and welcome, and your name again, sorry? Ellery and Marlene. Ellery and Marlene, welcome here. And I see the Hawks. I'd like to introduce my daughter, Jennifer. It's a privilege to have her come with us. Welcome, Jennifer. <laughs> so, so good to have everyone here. Now, I just reread a book, and Joel, I'm wondering if you could hold it up because I forgot it. And it's called, I Guess I Haven't Learned That Yet. It's by Shauna Nequist, and it's a simple and yet a profound read. She chronicles the things she is still learning. Some of that learning came as a result of a huge upset in her personal and spiritual life. I thought of that book as I think of the story of Mary and Martha. I'm looking forward to what Rachel has to say about the stories. The moral of, my, of that story in my upbringing was always, you should be more and not run around getting food on the table and doing. I wonder, though, if there isn't a little more to the story. I wonder if maybe there isn't a little piece of both Mary and Martha in all of us. I like to keep busy, and John would say I am lousy at relaxing. I, ha I haven't learned that yet. I can relate more to Martha than to Mary. Those of you would, that know me would, would know that I would ask Jesus if maybe we could go for a little walk and talk as as we walked, or I would make muffins while he sat and had coffee and we would converse that way. I have this image of Mary sitting at Jesus' feet absorbing every word. That would be hard for me. I am learning to sit and listen, to pray. Truth be told, my prayers can turn to worries as I lay in bed praying for people and the world. I find it hard to let go and let God. I haven't learned that yet. In the educational world, there is the concept of the power of yet. We move beyond just not knowing and leaving it there. There is the power of yet. Carol Dweck talks about a growth mindset. I haven't learned that yet. It is a process and a belief that we are all still learning. So I am still learning to be, to meditate on the words of Jesus, to prayer, to embrace both the Mary and the Martha within me. 
We're going to have our scripture reading now, and I want to invite any children that are here or any adult children like me, if you want to sit closer, we're going to have some pictures. And Shaka and Lainey are going to be reading scripture for us. Mary and Martha, based on Luke 10, 38 to 42. Sometimes it is easy to know the right thing to do, and sometimes it is hard. Sometimes the choice is between two good things, and it is hard to know which one is better. This is a story about a choice that Jesus' friends, Mary and Martha, had to make. One day... Jesus, along with the disciples, went to the home of his very good friends, the sisters Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Ma Martha showed Jesus how much she loved him by cooking a wonderful meal for him. She knew that Jesus stayed busy taking care of other people, so she liked to take care of him. Mary showed Jesus how much she loved him by sitting down beside him and listening to him talk about God's love. She couldn't get enough of his stories. Two sisters with two different ways of showing Jesus their love. Is one way better than the other? Let's listen to what happened. Where is my sister? Martha grumbled under her breath. Does she think I have six hands? I can't knead the bread and prepare the fish at the same time. The longer Martha worked alone, trying to get everything done by herself, the angrier she became. Ready to explode, she marched up to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that I have to do all this work alone? Make my sister help me. Maybe Jesus wasn't as hungry as Martha thought. Or maybe Jesus knew that Mary needed to hear about God's love more than she needed to cook. He said, Martha, you are running around like crazy. Why are you trying to do so many things? Look at what Mary's doing. What could you learn from her choice? John 11, verse 18 to 27. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that, would have, I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, and the one who has come into the world. Good morning. My name is uh, Randy Radikop. Uh, Rod had uh, invited me to share my faith story, so this is my response. 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. But as far as you continue in what you have learned and have become convinced 
of because you know those from whom you learned it from. In infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. What young boy does not want to be like his dad? In our case, we had a dad who was very, in very interested and even enthusiastic in what he was engaged in. Young children can sense true enthusiasm and feed off of it. Dad was a good communicator and took the time to explain why he was so enthusiastic and energetic in his vocational and recreation, recreational pursuits. When, when you are around someone like that 24-7, like I was, by the time, by the time I was uh, an adolescent, I was already largely imprinted in terms of where my own interests and enthusiasms would lie. But my parents' zest for life went beyond merely vocational or recreational pursuits, but I believe that they had a genuine joy of the Lord that immersed all aspects of their life. As a young child, I already had awareness that we were a family of faith where attributes such as prayer, worship with others, service, giving, and showing thankfulness were deemed important. While I was still in elementary school, I recall an experience where a visiting pastor came to our home and prayed for me. While I was at that age, I, at that age, I do not recall if I fully understood what it meant to repent. I would say this experience marked a moment um, where I experienced faith on a personal rather than on a familial basis. In subsequent years, through Sunday school and high school teachers, as well as youth leaders, I felt I had gained enough knowledge of the forgiveness Christ offered that as a teenager I was prepared to publicly confess my faith and was baptized at the Ebenezer Mennonite Church. These two occasions were, these two occasions were significant events in my faith development, but I do not want this to be where the story ends. Each morning as I read Rejoice Devotional, and a scripture passage and pray. I want to and I need to repent for a mind that is quick to become suspicious and for a heart that is slow to show love. Recently at one of our MCC meetings, I shared a devotional where I self-described myself as someone who does not move off his spot easily, living in the same community, staying in the same industries, pursuing the same recreational activities of my youth, I collected a vast collection of relationships that I was trying to maintain, which for the most part I felt were very, quite positive. When, COVID, when the COVID pandemic came upon us, like all of us, my face-to-face -face contact was instantly reduced to immediate family, a couple of managers, and a couple of friends who enjoyed biking in the bush. It made me think back to my childhood where I attended a small elementary school and we used our spare time building trails in the bush. I came to realize then that how relationally watered down I had become and had become largely ineffective in impacting people because I was trying to maintain too many relationships. Now that the pandemic uh, uh, restrictions are over, I do not want to go back to the way it was before. Rather, I want to be more deliberate on what, what I engage with so that I can be more effective in impacting those that I do engage with. As the churches closed for worship during the height of the pandemic, all believers had to redecide on how to proceed when the churches reopened. Some have decided that worship with others is not important and have discontinued. Others see viewing worship online as adequate. For Valerie and myself, we have encouraged each other that in-person worship with others is important and we want to continue on this path. My faith walk has always been closely intertwined with family. My faith was sparked and nurtured by my parents, supported and enhanced by my spouse, 
and now, ble- and now being blessed by our children as it gives us joy to see them pursue their marriages and the effort and sacrifice they place in, in raising their own young children. No one knows how many additional days the Lord will give to us, but in my case, it's safe to say the spring and summer seasons are past and winter may soon be approaching. (laughs) So, So this is a good time for me to reflect on some of my faith priorities. One new faith priority, having recently become grandparents, is finding ways to support our children as they attempt to install faith into their own children. But as for the other faith report, faith priorities, as I've reflected on it, um, I want to stay the course. Being involved in residential home construction and farming my entire adult life, I want to continue to do my part in offering access to clean water, shelter, and the ability to grow your own food to the very poorest people in our planet. Also, as the world becomes increasingly complex, the need for young people to gain faith education is as important as as ever, particularly in in gaining some skills on how to understand the Bible better. Has the world changed in my lifetime? since I was six, seven years old and making trails in the bush? On the one hand, yes. Technology is changing the world almost on a daily basis with the goal of making our lives more comfortable and convenient. And yet it appears that the world is becoming more hostile, more violent, more suspicion, and people are becoming more and more confused. On the other hand, has the world changed? No. The faith values of prayer, worship with others, service, giving, giving and, and showing thankfulness that my parents guided me toward are still as relevant as they have ever been. Before the pastoral prayer, I want to give a bit of an update on Rod and Kathy. Warm greetings. They would very, very much like to be here this morning. I was, Rod actually texted me this morning and uh, wished us well, as did Kathy. John and I had the privilege of visiting with them on Friday at Surrey Memorial Hospital, where Rod is. And if you notice in the bulletin, there is an update that Rod sent in about his cancer. Uh, He went into the hospital on Tuesday evening because of incredible pain. And what he had thought was food poisoning was actually a tumor in his stomach. It has now progressed to some other areas. Kathy is now on leave. She went back to work for two days and then went on indefinite leave on Wednesday. This is a hard time and a hard journey for them. They are humbled and grateful for this church community and for the incredible support that they have received. Many of you have contributed. I I, with some other people, put up a GoFundMe page for them to help with some of the expenses in the coming months. Uh, Living in BC when you've moved from Saskatchewan is not always easy. If you are not a Facebook person, but you would like to give uh, an offering of love, a love donation, you can leave the money either in the church office with Joel or give it to John or I or put it in our mailbox. Rod and Kathy covet your prayers and your love for them. Um, Just a little note, these donations are not tax deductible because they go directly to them. So we pray for them. Rod is in amazing good spirits, 
in the midst of the realities of their lives. Let's bow for prayer, please. Our Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with a sense of wonder and awe and worship because of you are a great and magnificent God. We want to remember the areas of the world where conflict currently exists. In particular, we pray for the people of Ukraine as they now have to deal with the destruction of a major dam and the flooding of the surrounding areas. Give the people a sense of hope that one day your peace will come. We pray for the homelessness in our community. May we be open to, to hear to those who have ideas on how to bring solutions to this complex issue. We pray for Frank Dick and for his entire family as they mourn the passing of his wife, Anne, and the mother to her children and grandchildren. We rejoice in the new members, Tim and Heather Lepke and Keone Redekop. May it be much joy as they come, as they come to serve you. We, we also remember the couples who are preparing for marriage, Joel and Rachel, Michael and Michaela, and George and Wilma, and give them joy as they prepare for their marriages. We pray for all in the congregation with health concerns. This morning in particular, we pray for Rod. We are deeply saddened for all the pain and discomfort he is experiencing. We pray for Kathy and their children that they will not feel anxious. Give Rod a sense of your presence as he goes through this journey, and we pray for the healing of the cancer. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our next two songs come from the section of our hymnal called Sharing Our Stories, Vocation, Work, and Rest. And so I hope that they will help us prepare as we uh, get ready to hear what uh, Rachel has to share with us later on this morning. So please stand and we will sing God Who Stretched the Spangled Heavens, number 529. <laughs> the arms that comfort.
Good start. I almost dropped everything. Good morning. Um, before I get started, Char just uh, asked that I also share um, that Rod is hopeful that he will be able to go home from the hospital, um, if not today, in the next few days. So let's keep that specifically in our prayers um, that he would get to be home where it's a lot more comfortable. Um, I also wanted to let you know before I dive into this sermon um, that my first resource for it was the book The Forgotten Followers, um, in which women from different denominations um, wrote short reflections on uh, different women from the New Testament. Um, so this was one of the main books of Rod's that inspired the choice of this entire um, sermon series, Stories of Faith. Uh, and so Rod has been much in my thoughts as I was writing. Um, it feels, feels a bit strange to get up and preach after the news that we've heard, so bear with me if I stumble. Okay, if you don't know me, my name is Rachel, and I am the family pastor at EMC. But I could introduce myself another way too, that maybe would tell you more uh, than a job title does about who I am. I'm, my name is Rachel, but I'm a Martha. My faith story feels interwoven with our scriptures today. I am a hostess with the mostest, the daughter of a woman whose greatest joy is having the whole family over, and the granddaughter of a woman who magically was always pulling a tray of cookies out of the oven when you popped by for a visit. She must have had some kind of radar. I was so impacted by this legacy that when I first moved out to Abbotsford, um, I had people over three out of my first four nights in my new place. And the one night that nobody came over, it's because I was busy making and freezing cookie dough so I could try that magic trick of my grandma's. Food is my love language, and hospitality is my joy. Um, now, I wanted to do something a bit different this morning, because as family pastor, I'm usually hanging out with kids and youth, and it's never this one-way communication with young people, so we're going to try some, some participation. Um, if you can turn in your seats, find someone who you didn't come here with today, and we're going to have some, some chit-chat. Um, so ask someone near you, what is a story when you experienced hospitality, who was your host or hostess, and what made it special? We'll take a couple minutes to discuss.
All right, hopefully you had time to share. And maybe this sparks some conversations you can continue after the service. <laughs> I love hearing you all enthusiastically participating in the chit chat. Uh, if I was really running this like a youth group, now we would just all share, but then there wouldn't actually be any sermon, which maybe some of you would like better, but I wrote something, so I'm going to keep going. So, sounds like we all have some stories of uh, being hosted well. I definitely do. Um, and so, it always bothered me that uh, Martha gets such a bad rap just for being a really good hostess. Like, is that a crime? So today I would like to bring justice for Martha and for all of the Marthas in the room and in our lives. You're welcome. Uh, I would like us to consider that maybe there was nothing wrong with what she did that day by cooking a nice dinner for her siblings and her guests. So let's start by looking at uh, what do we know about Martha? So basic facts, she lived in the village of Bethany, which was about two miles from Jerusalem, so not, not too bad, not too far of a trip. She lived with two siblings, both of whom have kind of their own stories in the Bible where they get the starring role, um, Mary and Lazarus. No mention is made of their parents, um, and the passage that was read to us so well by Shaka today um, says Martha is the one who opened her home to Jesus. So that tells us that Martha is the woman of the house. And even if you couldn't get that from the text, if you look up the name Martha, most sources will say that it's Aramaic for woman of the house. So pretty obvious right there. She's fulfilling her destiny. There's more to learn about Martha from these two stories, though. For much of recent Christian tradition, people have spoken about these sisters, Mary, the wise and devoted, and Martha, the shallow and overly concerned with her to-do list. So it makes sense, if you're looking at it that way, that Jesus kind of chastises her. But, as I said, there's so much more to Martha. Firstly, Martha is bold. She's the lady of the house, and uh, at a time when, if you look at the context in the Gospels, Jesus is starting to, to tip from everyone thinking um, he's amazing to people being a little bit wary of him. A couple chapters back, um, he performs a miracle and a town asks him to leave. So he's a controversial figure, um, but Martha doesn't just go to see him talk, but actually says, hey, come on back for dinner. Um, join my family. She very publicly associates herself with kind of a radical, controversial teacher. Um, and, not that I have anything against Mary, but we need to know it's Martha's idea to invite Jesus over. Secondly, we need to read this story in combination with the John 11 story, which we also heard. Um, again, in that story, uh, which is about the death and resurrection of Lazarus, um, Martha is very bold, this time in a way that shows faith uh, and devotion beyond what we've seen even from the disciples at that point. The passage says, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Martha seems to be suggesting to Jesus, before Jesus suggests it, that he could bring Lazarus back to life. She's saying, you can make this happen, Jesus, which is a bold move, a bold ask. And when Jesus proclaims himself the resurrection and the life, Martha's response is a declaration of her faith in him as not just a wise teacher, but as the Messiah, the anointed one. Martha is a woman of great faith. So then what do we make of this story of Mary the devoted and Martha the distracted? Mary the wise, Martha the busybody. 
Like I said at the top, I am a Martha, and that's a label I gladly put on myself. Because for me, to invite someone into my home is to tell them, you are important to me. To be busy cooking for them is to say, I care about you and your comfort and your enjoyment. And really, how can we enjoy our time together if our stomachs are grumbling because no one thought to put out a snack? Really. Um, in faith exploration class this spring, we talked about the word sanctification, one of those big $2 Christian words. On a basic Bible level, um, it means to make something holy or to set it apart, um, which is one of those definitions that, especially if you're talking to kids, it's like, that, that doesn't help. I still don't know what it means. Um, so my, my favorite definition that I found was actually from a, a secular source that was talking about how you can sanctify kind of anything. Um, it said that to sanctify something means to set that thing apart for the use intended by its designer. For example, I was going to point to Jeff's guitar now, but he didn't play guitar today. So think of a guitar. You could use a guitar to play hockey. It could be your hockey stick. You could try floating it down a river full of cargo. You could use it many different ways. But the person who designed and built the guitar had specific intentions for how it would be used. This guitar was created to make music. And to use it to make music, to use it for its original purpose, sanctifies it. You could say, the guitar is set apart for the purpose of making music. And so the more that it's used for that, the more in tune, uh, pun not intended, the more in tune with its purpose it becomes. So, you and I were created with intention created for purposes. Some we all have in common. If you were here last week for my last vocabulary lesson, uh, you'll know that we were all created to be shalomi. Thank you. Ten gold stars. Our shared God-given purpose is to restore shalom in the world. We were all created for relationship with each other, with God, with the earth, um, but we also have individual purposes, and I think a lot of us spend a lot of our life trying to find those things and lean into them, and that is exactly what we're supposed to do. When we find those things that feel like, yes, this was what I was made for, we are sanctified. We become more the person God created us to be. So maybe you're wondering why I've gone on this vocabulary tangent. Um, I believe that God created me for many things, uh, but one of those is hospitality. I almost never feel better than when I create a space where other people feel at home, or when I bring people together around something common. It's why I was up here grinning while you all had your chit chat. So I, I feel like I'm fulfilling a God-given purpose in those moments. I am expressing the love and the shalom of Jesus when I do those things. And this is why I felt so seen and understood when I read that storybook version of Martha and Mary's story, where it says, Martha showed Jesus how much she loved him by cooking a wonderful meal for him. She knew Jesus stayed busy taking care of other people, so she liked to take care of him. That just really resonated for me. Martha was no less devoted to Jesus than Mary was. She just expressed that devotion in different ways. So there you go. Justice for Martha. Nothing wrong with her choice to cook dinner. Short sermon. I have a however. If you were here in fall 2021 uh, when I first preached at EMC, um, you might remember that in that sermon I also knowingly contradicted myself and I'm kind of going to do that again. My first point is that Martha didn't make the wrong choice, and Mary's choice wasn't better. 
And my second point is that Martha did make the wrong choice and Mary's choice was better. <laughs> but I think that both can be true at the same time to varying degrees. Because uh, at the same time that I fully believe, and I hope you are all convinced now, that Martha was a wonderful, bold, caring woman of great faith, and that Martha has gotten a bad rap unnecessarily. We still have to contend with Jesus' own words to her. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This is how the story in Luke ends, with this judgment from Jesus and no explanation. So I would like to explore that a little bit. I think there are two, at least two reasons, for Jesus' response to Martha's stressed-out request for her sister to leave the presence of their teacher to go help in the kitchen. Firstly, I believe that Jesus was trying to model the radical ways of the kingdom of God, which notably busted down the barriers placed in front of women in the patriarchal culture of his day. It was a time when women were seen as property rather than people. They were not educated, they were not considered to count in situations like looking for a legal witness. Um, but in the story of Jesus, women are centered and uplifted over and over again. I think of the S Samaritan woman at the well, who was one of the first people to share the news of Jesus as Messiah. I think of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who had faith in the mystery of the gospel from Jesus' birth to death. She was there, and she believed. And I think of Mary Magdalene, the one to whom Jesus first appeared after his resurrection, the first person sent out to share the good news. Jesus tore down barriers for women. So when Jesus says, Mary chose better, maybe what he was pointing out to Martha is, Martha, you had a choice here. In a culture when you feel like you don't, typically Martha was doing exactly what the women's job was, the domestic tasks, meeting the expectations. And Mary was bucking tradition in favor of listening to and learning from Jesus, being a student and a disciple. Martha's complaint was fitting for the culture, but Jesus calls her out of that to see that in God's kingdom, Everyone is invited to sit at Jesus' feet to listen and learn. Maybe Martha did not like cooking. Maybe that wasn't the gift God gave her, the spe special purpose she was created for. Maybe she just thought that was her only choice. In this book, The Forgotten Followers, uh, Joanne Clark says that this story's feminist message reminds us that we can attain greater fulfillment as we become freer of the constraints and limitations of patriarchal society and learn to value ourselves as persons above and beyond our work, our doing for others. I think that message applies to you no matter what your gender, that all of us are valuable beyond the things that we produce or accomplish. We may not live in such a patriarchal society that men are automatically masters um, over the rest of the household or owners, but we still need the reminder that Jesus does not put limitations on people because of their gender, but simply calls one and all to come and learn and follow. Which brings me to the other reason for what Jesus says to Martha. He says, few things are needed, or indeed only one. I think that this is less about how Mary and Martha choose to show their love for Jesus in different ways. I think that we can all show our love in a lot of different ways. Um, I think that 
what Jesus is getting at here is that this is about how they receive God's love from Jesus. Mary hears that her sister has invited over this radical teacher who has been preaching a barrier-busting gospel of love. And Mary's first instinct is, I am going to go sit as close as I can get, sit at his feet, not across the room, right up close. And I am going to listen eagerly. Martha's first instinct, however, is to get to work. Now, I am not technically a Mennonite by ethnicity or by how I was raised. Um, so as an outside observer, it seems to me that Mennonite faith tradition um, expresses itself a bit more like a Martha than a Mary. Culturally, Mennonites are doers. This is why I fit in. A people who are quick to be the hands of, and feet of Jesus in beautiful ways. There is always a danger with that kind of mentality that I think is the same danger uh, that Martha fell into, that we slip out of doing from an outpouring of the love of Jesus to doing to earn the love of Jesus. How much time do we spend sitting at the feet of Jesus? Do we feel like we deserve that time with him? I think that's the other thing that Jesus is saying to Martha here and saying to us. So perhaps I could do my, my Rachel paraphrase of this passage and say that maybe Jesus said, Martha, my beloved Martha, you think you need to do so many things that these are requirements, but there are very few requirements. In fact, there's only one. You already have God's love. You are already valued and worthy. All you have to do is come and sit. That's all that Mary did. And so why would I tell her to go and work to earn something she already knows she has? You already have God's love. You are already valued and worthy. Although there is no definitive statement in the text, I personally believe that Martha was cooking out of love for Jesus. And I believe that her pleading for help uh, from her sister was just her having a very human reaction to an unequal workload with her sister. And as a person with sisters, I'm grateful for that human moment. It's good and right, and God loves it when we use our unique gifts and passions to show our love for others. But before Martha could be the hostess with the mostest, she needed to know and believe that she was a beloved child of God, regardless of whether she did anything. If dinner did not make it on the table, it doesn't change that. She needed to know and trust that she was welcome to be a student of Jesus, and there were no prerequisites for that class. And so I wonder, are you, like me, a Martha? Do you love to show your love through practical tasks? Then God bless you, because Marthas make the world go round. But here is my reminder for all of us, because we all have those moments, those Martha moments. And we all need to know that nothing you can do can earn you God's love or the place at Jesus' feet because you already have it. So don't let the things you should do eclipse the thing you were made for, the thing we were all made for, a rich and beautiful shalom-restoring relationship with Jesus. Thank you.
This is a benediction written by Reverend Heather Moody based on these scripture passages today. Go out into the world to serve God with love. Be ready to laugh with delight at the good news God has to offer you. Make room at your table for unexpected guests. When the work of discipleship leaves you weary or frustrated, rest in God's presence and listen to what God is saying. And the blessing of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit go with you today and always. Amen. Please stand and we will sing this song of sending and blessing that comes to us from Japan. May the peace of Christ, and we will sing through it twice. <laughs> 